hello everyone. Thank you very much for joining us in this first talk from the Physio webinar. This is an event organized by graduate students from the Physiology Graduate Program of the Institute of Biosciences of the University of Sao Paulo. This is our team. We organized four very interesting talks that will happen during October, November, and December with speakers from different countries talking about different terms of physiology and their intersection with other areas. Please follow us to get more information so you do not miss any of the talks. They will be amazing. Today, we are very pleased to welcome Dr. Michael Romero, a biologist who graduated in Swarthmore College, United States, master and doctorate in biology at Stanford University, and then postdoc in zoology at the University of Washington. Currently, he is a professor at the Department of Biology of the Tufts University of Medford and an adjunct professor of environmental and population health in Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine at the Tufts University of Grafton. His research focuses on the stress response of vertebrates, especially in wild animals, through an integrative approach relating behavioral, physiological, and endocrine aspects underlying stress. His research consists of closely linked laboratory and field studies in the fields of endocrinology, ecology, and neuroscience, all aimed at increasing our understanding of the causes and effects of stress in wildlife. Dr. Romero, thank you very much for your presence here today. After your talk, we will have 30 minutes to take questions from the audience. Everyone can ask questions through the YouTube chat. They can also be in Portuguese if you like, and our team will select and send them to me. This event will be recorded and will be available through YouTube after the transmission. With no more details, I'll give the word to you, Dr. Romero, and we will be here in the background in case of any technical problems. Well, thank you for that lovely introduction. And uh, let me see if I can share my screen here and start the slideshow. And let me initiate the pointer if I can. And does not look at looks like a lot. Okay. So what I'd <clears throat> like to do today is first of all, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm I'm really delighted to be have a chance to talk to all of you today. And the talk I'd like to present today is thinking about some of my work and other people's work that's been using stress physiology and conservation and trying to use the stress physiology as a way to predict human impacts on wildlife. And before I begin, I have to thank, um, I am sorry, everything is, is locked up. Let me try again. This all worked a minute ago, and of course it won't work now. Okay, so before I, I start, I need to thank all the members of my lab, both past and present, uh, people who have gotten their graduate work with me, people who have done undergraduate work with me, and then a whole bunch of very important collaborators. And all of this work is, is thanks to them as well. And my funding source is mostly funded from the National Science Foundation of the United States. Okay, so conservation. Essentially, in conservation, we are interested in trying to understand how human disturbance impacts population sizes. And this is sort of the gold standard in conservation. If you show that something will decrease population size, then we know it's something that's bad, and we need to try to do something about it. The problem with thinking about population size, though, is that it's an after the fact, a post hoc response. What we'd really like to do is figure out whether a human disturbance is going to affect population size before it actually does, so that we have a chance to either ameliorate it or stop it. 
And there's been a number of different ways in which people have done that over the years, one of which is try to use behavioral responses. So can we use uh, behavioral responses to predict which human disturbances will affect population size? And this has not been very successful. Uh, there's a lot of changes that animals will make behaviorally that actually won't impact behavior, populations. And so then other researchers have tried to use different physiological responses as this way of measuring or uh, determining whether or not the human disturbance is going to change population sizes. And there's a lot of different physiological responses that have been tried over the years. So here's some examples. Uh, people have looked at energy and nutritional physiology, immune function, reproduction, physiological responses to contaminants, physiology of movement, thermal regulation, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the things that has become really important to me is that stress makes all of these things worse. So whatever you're studying, if it's bad because humans are there, if the animal's under stress, it's gonna have a worse response. And before I go much further, what I'd like to do is tell you what I mean by stress, because a lot of people have different definitions of this word. And I like to think of stress as, as thinking about an, an animal that's in dynamic equilibrium. And so when there is a noxious stimulus or a stressor, it serves to disrupt that dynamic equilibrium. And if the animal does not cope with that adequately and reverse this problem, the animal's gonna be in deep trouble. And so it has a suite of adaptive responses called the stress response that serves to reestablish that dynamic equilibrium. Now, this is a great definition of stress, but it's not what most of us think about when we use the word stress. You know, we don't say, we don't think about this response when we talk about how our, that big exam next week is causing me a lot of stress. What we usually do are thinking about this response. When the adaptive response itself is overshoots and disturbs the dynamic equilibrium. And this is what we call stress-induced disease and is what is often studied by biomedicine. But for this talk and for conservation purposes, what I really think we need to do is focus on when those adaptive responses adequately and properly balance that stressor so that the animal reestablishes its dynamic equilibrium. Now, if we think about the re these adaptive responses, what we look at is a stressor that impinges upon an animal, and then the animal then has both hormone, hormone release and neurotransmitter release. These uh, chemical mediators can result in different physiological and behavioral responses, all of which are designed to help the animal to survive. If we put these two pathways together with human disturbance leading to population size and the stressor leading to survival, what we can see is that we can take the human disturbance and <clears throat> make it the stressor. And so now that stressor is hitting this animal. It's having all those use responses leading to survival. And the assumption is, is that the summation of the survival of all the individuals in the population will then potentially affect population size. So the idea of this talk, and many people are in this field, is that we can use this response, this, this response to stress as that intermediary step to determine whether human disturbance is likely to result in changes in population size. Okay, so what do I mean by stress in terms of the physiological responses? So if there's a stressor, it is detected by the brain. And the first thing the brain does is, is it has some sort of a discrimination or determination function. And what do I mean by this? Because the first thing the, the brain has to do is decide whether this stimulus is in fact a stressor. One of my favorite examples of this is, a, <clears throat> is a skydiving, where you jump out of an airplane with a parachute. You know, if you took me into an airplane and threw me out of threw me out of it with a, a parachute on, I would have a huge stress response. But a lot of people do this for fun. And what the brain is doing is determining whether or not that event is a stressor. Once the brain makes that decision, it initiates two responses. One is the release of catecholamines. This is uh, epinephrine and uh, norepinephrine. This is part of the fight or flight response and the sympathetic nervous system. 
And the other aspect is glucocorticoid release. Both of these are intended to help the animal to survive. If we look a little closer at the glucocorticoid release, what we see is, you know, here's an, an individual animal is being chased by this falcon. This is the stressor. So the brain determines that it is a stressor. It sends a signal to the hypothalamus, which sends a hormonal signal to the pituitary, which sends a hormonal signal to the adrenal gland until you finally get the release of your glucocorticoids. There's also negative feedback here. The glucocorticoids are carried in the blood by a binding protein and they have lots and lots of different effects in the body. The re I just go over this pathway briefly because it, the, this is a really critical aspect to my studies in that from the detection of a stressor through this cascade of hormonal events till you start to see the release of glucocorticoids takes about three to five minutes. So if we can catch an animal, so time after capture and looking at glucocorticoid levels, if we can catch the animal and take a blood sample in under about three to five minutes, this initial level, which we call the <clears throat> baseline level, is really reflective of what the animal was experiencing prior to capture. And then we can use the capture itself as a simulated predation event to monitor the increase in the glucocorticoids over time. And I'm gonna show you a lot of data today that it looks at especially these baseline levels and these stress-induced levels at the end. Okay, so that's, that's the preliminaries. Can we use corticosteroids as tools to understanding the impacts of global environmental change? This is a picture of some fires in Australia and you, know, you see a lot of habitats and, and fires with animals. How are glucocorticoids or can glucocorticoids be used as tools to understand these kinds of stress responses? I first got interested in this from a very old paper from 1997, which started a look at a, the impact of dog hunts on uh, stags or deer in England. And this was a, a, you know, a way of hunting where they would send out these dogs and, and the dogs would run the stags down. And then finally the humans would come up in their horses and, and shoot the, the stag. And this was a very popular form of entertainment for hundreds and hundreds of years. But in 1997, the pa this paper came out and showed and looked at cortisol and it compared them in stalked animals. So these are animals in which the humans just went out and, and from behind a tree or something like that in, in a stag that was not aware of the human presence and shot them. And when they looked at those um, cortisol levels, you see that they were quite low as compared to animals that were chased by the hounds. And if you see, this is a, approximately a 70 fold increase in the cortisol levels. Now, this particular study had a major impact on laws in, uh, in the UK, because based upon this idea that, that these stags were so incredibly stressed by being chased by hounds, this was one of the pieces of evidence that ended up banning uh, hound hunting of deer in, in, in Britain. So thinking about this kind of response, I started working on some conservation issues in my own work. And the first thing I'd like to show you is some work that I did in the Galapagos and the islands off the course, uh, coast of South America. And we were doing work on these creatures, the marine diving iguanas. And they are primarily herbivores. They almost exclusively eat the marine algae that's in the subtitle and in the intertidal. And they will eat it. It's a wonderful salad. They'll consume lots and lots of this, this uh, seaweed. And if you look underwater, you can see these massive beds of green algae. So this is what it's like during a normal year. And during a normal year, the conditions in the Galapagos are, are, are you know, the, the islands are right here on the equator and the sun will beat heavily down upon the ocean right near the Galapagos. And that creates an enormous amount of evaporation and all those clouds form and, <clears throat> and create massive storm clouds. But the trade winds push all of those, those rain clouds over to the west. And this is why you end up with rainforests in Indonesia and deserts on the coast of South America. 
The interesting part about this is that because of all that evaporation, you essentially form a hole in the ocean. And so there's upwelling of water from the deep ocean that carries all this cold water and nutrients, and it comes up right near the Galapagos and forms one of the richest fishing areas in the world. This is what happens during a normal year. During an El Nino, for some reason that we still don't understand, those trade winds fail. And when they fail, all of that moisture ceases to be moved towards Indonesia. And so you end up getting a drought in Indonesia. And all that rain will come right back down on top of the Galapagos and on top of the ocean. The impact partially of this is that that hole in the ocean never forms. And so you don't get that upwelling of all those nutrients. And so if you look at the impact in the Galapagos, you see that all the marine algae starts to die off and there's nothing for these marine iguanas to eat. Here's one just trying to, to eat the scum off the, off the rocks. And they start to lose all of their body fat. You can see that in this picture, the marine iguanas store their fat in their tail. And you can see at the base of the tail, there's essentially no fat left on this animal. And if the El Nino continues for too long, what you see is a lot of dead animals. And so one of the things that we were interested in understanding is whether or not stress physiology could, it could help explain who was going to live and who was going to die. And so we could catch these iguanas, take blood samples. So here's, uh, we put the iguana inside a bag, exposing the tail, and can take the blood sample from the tail. The other nice thing about iguanas is because they're reptiles, they like to be out and sun themselves. And their the marine iguanas are very phylopatric. They, like, they stay for most of their lives within a several uh, dozen meters of the, of the same stretch of beach. So we can go down and count how many lived and, how many, and therefore infer how many died during an El Nino. And when we plot those data, so here's corticosterone levels on <clears throat> the x-axis taken at 15 minutes after uh, holding them in the bag and compare that to the percent survival on the y-axis. What we see is on each of these islands, we see this nice relationship. The white dots, by the way, are islands during a normal year, a non-El Nino year. But what we see is that the higher the levels of corticosterone levels on each of these islands, the lower the survival is of the animals on that island. Okay, so you might be asking yourself, this is an El Nino. It's a very natural uh, thing to, that these animals have to face. It could be tragic, but this is not a conservation concern because this is a natural event. The unnatural event occurred a little bit later. And this is uh, the Jessica, which was an oil tanker bringing fuel for the tourist boats. And it ran, on a, it ran across a reef, busted a hole in, the, in its hull and spilled a, a quite a bit amount of oil into the ocean. And that had a large effect, as you can see here on, in the background is the Jessica. In the foreground are these iguanas that are covered in oil. <clears throat> this is where the uh, ship ran aground, the Jessica, right on the coast of San Cristobal. And the major currents carried the oil right towards the island of Santa Fe. And three days before the Jessica ran aground, we were right on that coast in Santa Fe, right here, collecting stress samples from marine iguanas. Now, I had already gone back to my, my home institution in the United States and was starting to teach classes, but we managed to get a couple of Ecuadorian graduate students back out onto the island to take samples uh, within two or three days of the oil reaching the islands. And this is what we found. And I'm sure this surprises absolutely nobody who is watching this. The green, here's our under three minutes sample. Here's the stress response. This is a pre-oil spill. And what we see is huge increases in the oil contaminated animals in their baseline and huge increases in their response to stress. So we had stressed animals on the island. In some ways, you know, who cares? We stress the animals, uh, but not a lot of animals died. So there was this cartoon from uh, Ullman up in the Oregonian, sort of in, inferring it that this was going to be a major, major problem. We were going to see all these dead animals. And this was based on all the other kinds of oil spills that have happened around the world. But interestingly enough, there were very, very few animals died 
in the Galapagos. And so it didn't look like there was a problem. And in fact, the oil company basically told the National Park Service of the Galapagos, hey, we didn't kill any animals. There really was no harm. Uh, and so therefore, we're not, you know, really, it's not a problem. We, we wish it hadn't happened, but it really isn't an issue. However, we took these levels again at 15 minutes and brought and inferred then that we were getting about 11 nanograms per mil of corticosterone at 15 minutes in our oil contaminated animals. And we then used our graph from the El Nino at about 11 nanograms per mil. And therefore we predicted that we would see about 60, maybe of 65% survival or about 35% or 40% mortality in the animals. And this was before any animal died, or at least we could find any animals that died. What actually happened when we came back a year later after the oil spill, this was in, in the uh, Henovesa, which is a different island that was not affected by the oil spill at all. And there was 100% survival of those animals. On Santa Fe, however, only about 45% of the animals were still alive a year later. So only, so about 55% uh, mortality. And this matches reasonably closely the prediction that we had of, <clears throat> of who would live and how many would die. And we think the reason why we were able to predict the survival and mortality is that the oil spill uh, sort of mimicked a El Nino event, basically starvation. So the marine iguanas have an endosymbiotic bacteria that breaks down the algae in their stomachs. And what we think is that the oil killed their endosymbiotic bacteria and that these animals essentially then starve to death just like they would during an El Nino. Interestingly, no, uh, though, it, this is a worse effect of, uh, of uh, the oil spill than the El Nino because whereas El Nino mostly kills the largest iguanas. So if you collected the skulls here and just put them together from animals that we found, skeletons that we found that were dead after an El Nino, you see these are all very large skulls. So these are very large individuals. Whereas the oil spill killed iguanas of all ages. And so even killed the younger ones. So that means the population could recover much faster with after an El Nino than it would after the oil spill. And just to give you a little bit of, uh, of hope in this whole thing. So the oil company said that, that they really were not, um, didn't need to pay anything for having uh, spilled all this oil because there really was no harm. And our paper was, I am told, the primary evidence that showed that yes, there was harm that took place from their oil spill and resulted in a many million dollar verdict in the Ecuadorian courts against the oil company. And that money was paid to the Galapagos National Park Service. Okay, so just thinking also about human disturbance. This is, I love this picture because it shows uh, Manhattan Island in New York. Uh, and the right-hand side is what is look, look like, like today, but on the left-hand side is what that looked like 400 years ago. And so somehow, if animals are going to continue surviving on our planet, they're going to have to adapt to, to being living in this kind of condition to living in this kind of condition, living with human disturbance. And to show you some of the work that we've done on that, I want to go back to the Galapagos. Because one of the things humans have done on the Galapagos Islands have introduced feral dogs and cats. So these are escaped pets or animals that were born in the wild. And they spend a lot of time uh, attacking and killing marine iguanas. So this is a dog of a friend of ours. <clears throat> and you can see, here's the iguana. This iguana is letting that dog get really, really close. In fact, they can get so close that before they run away, these iguanas, just like many animals in many islands, have essentially no fear of these introduced predators. And we know this is a problem because we can find iguanas with bite marks on their tails. And <clears throat> at one point on one beach, so many animals were killed by feral dogs and cats that the Ecuadorian military collected all of them and burned them to prevent disease from out having an outbreak. So why aren't these animals learning? So this is a graph showing a flight initiation distance. 
So how close will those animals allow a human to get before they run away? And if there's no dogs or cats on the island, they will let us get really close up to, you know, within a meter. And this is essentially how we're able to catch these animals. We can get so close, we can just reach down and grab them and pick them up. When dogs and cats are present, these animals are learning. So their flight initiation distance will increase up to almost four meters. But still, that's not particularly impressive. A, a green iguana on the mainland would probably start running at 100 meters as that, when it saw a human, not let them in four. And this is still, even though they're learning, it's still probably not enough to prevent being attacked by a cat or a dog. So why aren't they learning more? We tested this idea by injecting, using this long pole, injecting epinephrine right into the base of their tail. And epinephrine is one of the major fight or flight hormones. And then we came back 15 minutes later and measured their flight initiation distance. And when we do that, what we see is that if we inject water, the vehicle, there's about a meter and a half of their flight initiation distance. And just by injecting epinephrine, we can increase that to almost three meters. So they are responding to epinephrine, but they're really not responding very strongly. So we think that one of the ways in which these iguanas have adapted to island living is to decrease their stress response. And even though they're mounting an epinephrine response, they're not having the same kind of uh, effect from that epinephrine that other animals would. And so there are, we think that their ability to adapt to these introduced predators is very limited. I also wanted to talk about whether we can use modeling to predict the conservation consequences of stress. And this is uh, some work that I did with uh, Nina Pfefferman and we created this individually based simulation model. And let me just walk you briefly through this model. So we start with a population size and a total energy that's available in the environment. And we uh, alter that environmental energy seasonally. We then ask whether the animal has, what kind of foraging success it has and calculate the energy that it gained and then compare that to the individual's energy requirements. And those individual energy requirements are normally distributed. And then we ask, did it gain enough? So if it, didn't, if, if it uh, didn't gain enough energy from its foraging, we decrease the condition. If it gained enough, we increase condition. And so then we measure the animal's, an the animal's condition. And if it was below zero, then the animal died, we decrease the population size by one. If a condition was over zero, then we ask, is this the month that they breed? If it's not, then we reiterate until it is a breeding month. And at that time, we add one year to the life of the age of the animal and ask, is the, in, in the in individual too old? And so we had senescence at age 10, and that was, again, normally distributed. And if it wasn't too old, then we asked, is the condition sufficient to reproduce? If it's not, the animal would skip breeding that year and keep, um, and keep going back through. If it was uh, sufficient to reproduce, we added one to the population, and because uh, it costs, it's costly to reproduce, to produce eggs, to produce offspring. Uh, we decreased its condition. Okay, so that's the basic model. What we then did was added stress. And we did this by creating an average stress in the population varying between zero or a population that was not stressed to 50, completely stressed. And this was then normally distributed per, per individual around that mean. So we have stress. One of the things we know that stress will do is it will reduce foraging success. So each of the individuals that was under stress would have lower success in getting energy. The other aspect that we know about stress though is that low amounts of stress will decrease energy use and can actually be beneficial. For example, it, pr it can promote night restfulness where you, the animals will actually use less energy at night uh, than when they're not stressed. But a medium amount of stress will <clears throat> Uh, not have much of effect. And what we postulated was that high stress will decrease energy use and will be de detrimental. So that then changed, we used low, medium, and high stress to change the individual energy requirements. We then did a whole bunch of Monte Carlo simulations, ran through this a couple, 10,000 times or so, and calculated the population numbers. And these are the kind of data that we got. 
So they start on year one. And what we look is at about age eight or nine, they end up uh, stabilizing. And what we see is that they stabilize in essentially three groups, a really high stress group that we call group one, a medium stress group, a group two, and a very low stress in group three. And so then we ask, what are the, what's happening in these three groups? And I'll show you the physical condition. So <clears throat> the physical conditions on the y-axis, on the x-axis is the <clears throat> condition of the animals uh, based upon the amount of stress that they see as average in the population. So as the average stress goes up, then the physical condition goes up. So the physical condition improves. So this is group one. These are these individuals here that have the lowest uh, population numbers. So this is exactly the opposite what we would have predicted. We would have thought that high individuals under high stress and populations under high stress would show a lot of individuals that were in very bad condition. But in fact, we're seeing exactly the opposite when we run this model. We also then looked at the age of reproduction. And once again, there's very little difference until we get to the really high stress group. And then we find that the age of reproduction goes up. So we're talking about much, much older individuals that are reproducing on average in these high stressed groups. So we got two non-intuitive results from this model. One is that in populations where the average individual is exposed to high levels of stress, they are going to rely preferentially on the oldest and most physically fit individuals for reproduction and population persistence. And again, this is exactly the opposite of what many of us would think. We would go out into the field and we'd sample a population and find a lot of animals that were, that were not in very good shape. And we'd say, hey, that must be a stressed population. But in fact, it might be exactly the opposite, that those are the populations that are actually doing well because they can actually, uh, they, those individuals in poor condition are not dying. So this means that the reliance on the most physically fit individuals led to the average physical condition being highest in the populations where the average individual experiences the most stress. So then what we tried to do with the model was have a transient increase in stress. And so for one year, we increased the average stress by 10%. And we did this in two ways. The first was that we increased every individual by 10%. And this models a stronger stressor, the same stressor, but just of a stronger magnitude. And when we do that, here is, uh, we do that at, at year 10. And so we see this big decrease in population numbers for the year but they recover and every single group recovers and we see that we get, again, the stratification of the groups. So this doesn't seem to have too much of a, an impact, long-term impact, it has a high short-term impact, but not a long-term impact. The second way we tried to do this was we reassorted stress around the new mean. And this model's an additional stressor. So instead of having, you know, building roads through the, um, habitat, maybe we can also introduce pathogens. So we had a different stressor. And when we do that, we see a huge decrease in all the populations. And in fact, we start to see a lot of these high stress groups uh, going extinct. So compare that up here to when we just decreased, uh, increased it, by every individual by 10%. If we reassort around that new mean, we're actually driving a lot of these uh, populations extinct, especially the high stress ones. So the conclusions from the model. First is that the average physical condition of individuals of a population may be a very poor measure of how much stress the population is experiencing. And this is exactly the opposite of what many of us would think when we go out and measure populations. Second is that any disturbance that affects the oldest and most physically fit individuals could have a disproportionate effect on the population especially thinking about stress populations where you know, we might allow hunting of you know, males with the biggest um, displays and things like that. And then finally, populations may be relatively resilient to variations in magnitude of the same stressor, but highly vulnerable to exposure to new stressors. So all of this can now be tested in the field. I just wanna reiterate, these are conclusions from a model. So what I've been talking to you so far has been thinking about using this model of using stress in 
conservation, but I've been talking about acute stressors. What if we think about chronic disturbance, which relates to chronic hormone release? Is that also can be modeled through this? And here's some of the old data showing some of this. This is some of the original data looking at glucocorticoids. And this is on the Northern Spotted Owl. And the black bars are males who are nesting within 0.41 kilometers of a road. And those where the road is farther away. And we can see that their uh, hormone levels are much higher. This is from a major road. This is again within 0.41 kilometers of forest uh, activities where cutting down trees, much higher if their nest is close by those kinds of activities. So it looks like from these early data, stress was causing an increase in the hormone levels. Very similarly, this is looking at elk in, uh, in a national park in North America. And during the winter, there's a lot of snowmobiles that love to, to ride in those parks. And when there's a high level of visitation, you know, over 300 um, visits per uh, week, what we see is that the stress levels in these uh, animals goes very high. So it looks like in these early data that a high levels of glucocorticoids meant that they were in stress and being stressed by these events. So however, we tried to do something more instead of trying to correlate it, we tried to do this experimentally. So we had these European starlings, we had them nesting in these nest boxes we put up. And then four times a day, we would go do something like put a simulated predator, this is a plastic rat, and put it on top of the nest box. We put some uh, snakes at the bottom, we would sit down underneath the nest box and read for a half an hour. And do this three, four times a day, prevent the female from going in and incubating and, fe and um, feeding her chicks. And what we find is that the plasma corticosterone levels in those females goes down. So exactly the opposite, what was happening with the spotted owls and with the elk. We then repeated this experiment on two different species, the white-eyed vireo and the black cat vireo. Uh, we found their nests and we put different kinds of things at their nests three or four times a day. Here's their initial levels. There's absolutely no difference between the controls and those that were chronically stressed and their stress-induced levels, no change in either species. So we see an increase in spotted owls and elk. We see a decrease in European starlings. We see no change in white-eyed vireos and black cat vireos. What in the world is going on? And it's even worse because we look at the marine iguanas again. And we looked at animals that were an undisturbed uh, areas of the island that never see tourists because there's no tourist trails there, compare them to animals right on the tourist path. And the levels actually go down in the tourist area. So how can we explain this? So in some theoretical work, one of the things that we can do is we can look at, at these kinds of data and we can look at glucocorticoids in two different populations. So population one is lower than population two. So in this scenario, population one could be lower. This is, and this is then a healthy response where the glucocorticoids are fully balancing the response of the stressor. Whereas in this group, you have a pathological response where the glucocorticoids are overshooting this and creating the problem. This is what biomedicine would tell us. And this is what most of us assume is going on. But this could also reflect this scenario in which population one, which is lower, is having an insufficient response and therefore creating a problem, whereas population two is making the healthy response. So what's going on here? This would presume that the tourist area is actually population one, and we're looking at this scenario where there's an insufficient response. But in many ways, that's a, a post hoc and after the case uh, explanation of these data. And a colleague of mine, Susanna French and her colleagues went and repeated these, uh, this study on a slightly different island and saw exactly the opposite where the undisturbed animals were lower and the tourist animals were higher. And so what we see is, in, they interpret it as being this scenario where the tourist individuals were had the pathological response. And so how do you determine between these two different responses? And part of the issue is, is that Many of these responses 
are not uh, supported by the literature. So a graduate student in my, and I, uh, Molly Dickens, asked this question, what does a chronically stressed wild animal look like? Is there a common endocrine profile? And we did a literature search and looked at 216 different studies, and we're comparing very different studies and aside each study a score, where one was a decrease, two was no change, or three was an increase. And <clears throat> And this was just to, to standardize all these different studies that were using different animals, different uh, types of creating chronic stress. And so here we have a decrease, here we have no change, here we have the increase, and here is our mean of 148 different studies looking at baseline glucocorticoids. And they do seem to be an increase, but this yellow bar is the variation surrounding that estimate. And if we look at the underlying studies, what we see is that Sure, 87 of those studies showed an increase, the majority of them, but a very large minority showed no change, and even a bunch of them showed decreases. So it's difficult to predict what a specific study would show. The situation is even worse when we look at stress-induced glucocorticoids. There were 80 studies that did that. They were slightly over no change, but huge amount of variability. And if, again, we look at the underlying studies, 34 show a decrease, 34 show an increase, and 24 showed no change. The reason why it's not exactly two is because we weighted some of these studies on the basis of, of things like sample size. So the take-home message here is that from the data, there's no consistent response. And so if we think about this from the endocrine profile, the literature does not actually support a generalized endocrine profile of how wild animals respond to chronic stress. The common predictions are based almost entirely on theoretical models rather than empirical data. But I don't want to say that glucocorticoids cannot reflect chronic stress. They can, but the endocrine profile will be species specific and both decreases and increases are likely to reflect chronic stress. In other words, both of these scenarios where the insufficient response and an overshooting response are going to reflect chronic stress in animals that are in trouble. The odd thing is though, that you cannot rely upon simple measures of glucocorticoid release to diagnose chronic stress. And so for the last of my talk, what I'd like to do is just talk about what you can use to measure uh, diagnose chronic stress. And one of the ways to do that is to measure something more than just the baseline and the response to stress, but also to look at negative feedback or what is the maximal possible response that the animal can mount. And here's an example of this from another graduate student of mine, um, Melinda francis Keeney, looking at tree swallow responses to PCBs. And we see no changes in baseline, no changes in, in the saline, which is the stress-induced, no changes in negative feedback, but there was a change in how their maximal possible response. So that with high PCBs, there was a change. So this is the response that's changed in this study. If we look at other studies, this is uh, another project, a project by another graduate student of mine, um, Christine Latin, and looked at house sparrow responses to crude oil. And again, no differences in baseline levels, but the stress-induced court levels were lower with oil. There was no change in negative feedback, but another huge difference in the maximal possible response. So these animals were showing a deficit in these two aspects of the response. And finally, I just wanna talk about translocation and the studies that we did there. And this is uh, the deliberate and mediated movement of wild individuals from one part of their range to another. Unfortunately, there's a high rate of failure of this. So that one study, one uh, review showed that there's a 54% failure uh, using especially sensitive, threatened or endangered populations. So a lot of people have been talking about translocation and how this is a way of saving populations that are under threat. So why is there such a high rate of failure? Well, one of the possibilities is that it's, they're stressed. And so another grad student of mine, Molly Dickens, tested this using this, this bird, the chucker, that's been introduced to the North American desert, the Mojave Desert. And what she did was she trapped animals at one site, in this case, site X, and then moved them all the way across the habitat and release them at another site. And this is areas where they also have these, um, what are called guzzlers, they're uh, artificial water sources. And 
So she would translocate the animals over to here. And these were eight kilometers away over ridges, valleys, and mountains. And unfortunately, uh, <clears throat> what we discovered is that, uh, that they ended up not working. So the first thing we did was we translocated them to these two areas, A and B. They're seven, six to seven kilometers away. And all of these animals walked back. So the second year, we translocated them way over to sites D and E, and they did not walk back. But what we did was four different uh, treatments. We uh, measured their stress responses before capture or just at capture. We then trapped them and immediately released them back to where we caught them. And then two groups we put into pens for two weeks, which mimics what the veterinarians will do to make sure that you don't uh, put uh, diseased individuals into the new habitat. And then one of the groups as a control, we would just return them right to the place where we caught them. And then the true treatment group where they were translocated to the new site. And when we look at that, we see both changes. The really important one is this translocation site. They're different in the baseline levels. There's difference in stress-induced levels, and there's differences in the negative feedback. So in this case, all three of these aspects of their glucocorticoid responses were different. So let me just complete my and, and wrap up here. So we have this model of how human disturbance can, through the stress response, we can predict, hopefully, what the ending uh, results will be at population numbers, levels. And the take home, if they get anything from my talk, is that stress physiology can be a useful tool in conservation, but the simple corticosterone measures are insufficient. And just finally, uh, if this is at all interesting to you and you enjoy this kind of talk and are interested in more information, uh, John Wingfield and I recently uh, published this book, Tempest, Poxes, Predators, and People, that goes into a lot of this in a lot more detail. So thank you for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you, Dr. Romero. Now I have some questions from the audience. So let's begin with, in the iguana case, are the high corticosterone levels um, one of the cause of the iguana's low survival rate or is a consequence of the same stressful event like human impact? Oh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Is it high glucocorticoid levels causing the death? I don't think so, uh, if that was, was the actual question. Um, it is possible. Uh, it's, it's an experiment I had hoped to be able to run, but wasn't able to. Uh, so I guess, so one of the questions is, is the glucocorticoids actually killing the animals? Uh, they do kill uh, salmon. So when salmon go up and die in their rivers, uh, it's usually glucocorticoids that are actually causing the death. What I think is going on is that those glucocorticoids are trying it, to create one last uh, uh, attempt to survive. And so they're high just prior to death because the, the animal is desperately trying to do all that it can to survive. And so that's, I think, why it correlates so well with the survival on the island, on each individual island, is because each individual island, those animals are closer uh, to death as when we're measuring them at the end of the El Nino. Okay. I hope that answered the question. I think so. <laughs> uh, the second one is, once the animal are exposed to the chronic stress factor, does it become used to the event? Again, you're gonna have to repeat that question. I'm not sure I understood. I think that is, um, if there is an animal that is exposed to a chronic stress, uh, can this same animal uh, become used to the event? Can he habituate somehow and do ah. not predict as a stress event? I think that's the question. Yeah, that's a great question. And it's, it really is unknown uh, because there's two different ways that animals can habituate. They can habituate and they can acclimate. And you can, this is the way I like to think about it. Habituation is learning that a stressor is actually not a stressor. Okay. So you think about my example of going up into an airplane and jumping out with a parachute. 
the people who like to do that have learned that jumping out of an airplane is not a stressor. They've habituated to it. If you are, when you can continue to take, get exams as a student, do you habituate to taking an ex the exams? There's still a stressor, but you don't have the same kind of response. And so you acclimate to the stressor, but it's not that you've learned that it's not a stressor at all. And so do the animals that are exposed to chronic stress, do they ever habituate or acclimate to those chronic stressors? Probably sometimes, but often probably not. It would really depend upon the stressor and how the animal is interpreting it. Okay. And there is a big one here. Try to translate like something understandable to you. And sometimes to evaluate stress, we use invas invasive methods and occasionally euthanasia. However, for more vulnerable populations, this could be more complicated uh, from an ethical point of view and can decrease the population, some stuff like that. What do you think of the use of an alternative methods such as measuring corticosterone in the urine and feces, for example? Yeah, I think that it can be a great technique. Uh, the, the only issues or problems uh, with doing these kinds of techniques in wildlife, I mean, urine is a great example. Uh, most animals do not urinate where you can collect them, right? It's, it's really hard to sit underneath a, a tree with a bird or a monkey and stick a vial right underneath it while it's urinating. Uh, there are people that do it. Uh, I have a colleague here at Tufts who studies chimpanzees in Africa, and they are always collecting the urine off of the le leaves. And it's a terrific way of doing it, but it, it's, it's a fairly limited number of animals and species. And I think you could actually do that in the wild. It is a much, much better technique for laboratory work. Um, feces is very similar. It's, it's better than urine in terms of the ability to collect it from wild animals. You just have to be very careful with knowing what it is you're actually measuring in the feces. So for example, something that's often uh, ignored in the literature, is there's a couple of really interesting papers showing that the amount of water content in the food that the animal is eating can change the gut transport time, the amount of time it takes for the feces to go essentially from the um, duodenum all the way down to the rectum. And the longer that period is, the more time there is for uh, the fecal glucocorticoid metabolites to be put inside the feces. And so the longer that takes, the more you measure in the feces, even though there actually is no difference in what's in the blood. And so, you know, one of the th kinds of studies that you have to be really careful about is comparing, for example, the wet season versus the dry season. Because in a dry season, you're going to find higher levels of glucocorticoid metabolites simply because the feces takes longer to get through the gut because there's lower water content in the food. So there's a lot of, uh, Uh, technical issues that you have to be concerned about with fecal measurements. But if you can work those out, and it and usually has to be worked out on each individual species basis, but if you can work it out, then the results and the ability to do things can just be spectacular. You can really get some really interesting data that you could never get in any other way from free living animals. Okay. I think that the next two are somehow related. Um, All the studies that you made, or at least you mentioned, uh, are regarding plasma corticosterone levels. Do you know if there is uh, what the literature on fecal glucocorticoid says regarding chronic stress in wild population? Is there this kind of literature? There is. A lot of the studies I showed in that uh, review paper where we uh, looked at papers that had uh, administered chronic stress and then look to see what the pattern was. Some of those were fecal studies, some of those were plasma studies, some were urine studies. Um, in general, chronic stress seems to be more likely to increase glucocorticoids than the plasma studies, but it's not universal. There's still a lot of, of difference that takes place with it. So uh, not all the data that I showed you actually was from plasma. I, I didn't actually point out 
some of the studies where we were looking at, at fecal levels in, in the birds. But, okay. um, but most, of the, most of the data that I showed you were. But we've done a lot of work with feces as well. And it, like I said, it's, it's a really great technique if you can do it. It tends to be probably a better measurement of chronic stress than plasma but not necessarily a better response than looking at all of the areas, you know, of the, um, of the HPA response that I showed you, you know, the baseline stress induced negative feedback and stimulated that can be just as powerful. Okay. And um, also you mentioned uh, the other measures is a question of mine. <laughs> um, what do you think about other measures in order to include in the studies of chronic stress, uh, immune measures, DNA damage, what do you have to say about it? Do you like them? Do you think it's interesting in a, um, in a complex way? What do you think about them? Yeah, I think a lot of the techniques are really good. Um, they tell you different things. Uh, you know, we just, we just published a paper uh, earlier this year that is, um, the first author is Gormley. Uh, and she, and she and I uh, put together all the techniques that we could find in the literature and put them on a, uh, not a, a sort of a timeline because every single one of these different techniques that you're talking about has a different timeline and how long it, it's measuring and, and integrating the measure and how long it you require before you can see a response. So just as an example, you catch a bird and you take a blood sample, that's almost immediate, you know, what, what the samples are in the blood at that time. Whereas if you take a fecal sample, that is the integration of all of the, the um, metabolites that are put in that fecal pellet from the time, that moment to the time from the previous defecation, right? Okay. And if you're looking at something like DNA damage, that is integrating the entire time that the damage was taking place. So something like telomere length, that's going to be even a longer period. Telomere length usually is a really good at assessing chronic stress over months to years, not hours to minutes. And so the technique that you choose really has to be dependent about what the question you're asking and what is the integrated length of time that you're interested in measuring. Okay, thank you. And there is another one here. Um, in your literature, Uh, about chronic stress, did you find variability between studies using the same species, genus? Uh, in other words, what do you know about variability in individual populations and phylogenetic groups? Good question. And it is in many ways uh, the biggest unknown and things that we still need to learn. So you have asked the question in three different groups, and I'm going to have to give you probably three different answers. So from the individual's point of view, uh, the, the responses change all the time. They change between day, they change, you know, day and night. Uh, they change seasonally, monthly. They change depending upon the, um, the physiological response of the animal. A lot of this is uh, there's some theoretical work being done on this using the, if you're interested, using both the um, allostasis model that's by McEwen and Wingfield and the reactive scope model that I and my students put together. But, you know, just think about your response to a stressor might be quite different if you have a broken leg uh, in, or an individual who is sick might respond very differently to a predation attempt than one who was not sick. And so just the physiological response of the animal at the moment of, the, of this new stressor can completely change the way it responds. And so there's huge inter-individual differences. And then you can talk about differences between individuals, you know, across individuals, different individuals will experience a habitat in very different ways. So, you know, a subordinate animal of, of a, in a group will have a very different response than the dominant animal. So there's a huge amount of variability there. What is the, re, you know, the impact of that on wild, wild animals? It's, it's not always well known. And then you look at populations. Populations can vary dramatically in how, well, how much they, um, they respond, uh, just depending on whether or not, you know, they're you know, facing a storm and population variability, and then all the way up to phylogenetic groups. So 
some of the closely related phylogenetic groups might have very, very similar uh, levels and similar responses. But, you know, from greater, the greater the, phys- the phylogenetic distance, boy, sometimes these things can be crazy. So reptiles and amphibians, their baseline levels of glucocorticoids are usually around one or two nanograms per mil. Birds are usually up around 20 or 30 nanograms per mil. Rodents are up around 50 to 100 nanograms per mil. Bats are usually up around 200 nanograms per mil. Monkeys are up usually around five or 600 to 800 nanograms per mil. And we have some in, uh, individuals in brown lemmings that live up in the Arctic and they're up around 5,000 nanograms per mil. So huge amount of variation. Nobody has a clue what that means. Okay, that's a tough question, right? Um, there, since you talked about variability, uh, result from studies performed in nocturnal or diurnal animals present the same kind of distribution considering the stress response? Yeah, as far as we know, uh, there don't seem to be systematic differences between nocturnal and diurnal animals. The circadian rhythms are different. So the peak in glucocorticoid levels will occur shortly before the beginning of the activity period. So for a laboratory rat, for example, which is nocturnal, the peak will be um, just prior to lights on, so in the morning. Whereas for us, uh, it's the same, uh, it'll be, the peak will be, so I'm sorry, it's the other way around. The peak in the, in the rodents will be right just as lights are going off, so in the evening. Whereas for a diurnal species like us, it peaks in the morning just prior to us waking up. So those kinds of circadian rhythms are different. But as far as we know, the responses to acute chronic stress are essentially the same. Okay. Um, stress response is so complex and dynamic, but many studies, studies still try to evidence it based on the one or two measured variables at one single time point. What do you... what? What would be your advice regarding transposing physiological complexity to conservation issues? Well, I think that we, what we need, and I was trying to, to portray this in my talk, is I think that you know, one or two measures, especially measures of glucocorticoids, is not sufficient to tell you much of anything. There's so much variability that we, you need to have uh, more things that you're measuring in order to you know, tell conservation managers, that their animals are under stress and they need to do something about it. Uh, the other thing is, is that this, you know, stress physiology is only a tool. Um, I'm reminded of uh, colleagues of mine who study uh, penguins at these penguin colonies in Argentina. And, you know, they show that this, the animals at where they're being visited by tourists are more stressed than the animals that are not where tourists are. But, you get rid of the tourists, you get rid of the dollars that they're using, and you, you don't have a, uh, a national park anymore because that's the money that's funding the national park and the conservation effort. So you, I think that uh, all of these things are just tools that you have to think about. And just because an animal is stressed does not necessarily mean that it's going to be in, in trouble. And it does not necessarily mean that the population isn't better off if some of the animals are exposed to humans. Okay. Uh, could you elaborate one on? Could you elaborate on the effect of multiple stressors and how these synergistic effects can affect the stress response? Yeah, fantastic question. Um, I don't have a good answer for you. We're doing those experiments right now, uh, trying to come up with you know way that multiple stressors interact and and you know almost all the studies that you read about are using one kind of stressor. Uh, the impact of different multiple stressors at the same time is not commonly done. And it's not always clear exactly what you're going to get. Uh, in general, what we think, and so the theory is, is that the, all of these different stressors become additive. So if you have this kind of response to one, and then, then you can layer on top of that, the responses as they get more and more exposure to more and more different stressors. Uh, the few studies that have done it, that's what they show. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that we've done enough of that work to be really, really confident in that yet. Okay. 
Um, do you believe that both quantity and quality of energy reserves and food have a great effect on the way animals respond to acute stressors? I uh, yes, I do. I think that uh, it, if if an animal is well fed and has access to good quality food and, and has the energy reserves, it's going to have a very different response than um, an animal that is not well fed and doesn't have qual access to quality food. Absolutely. Okay, I think we do not have any more questions at this point. So thank you very much for this amazing talk, Dr. Romero. Uh, thank you all at home that took some time to be here with us today. Um, I hope you have enjoyed this talk as much as I did. And we see you all in the next talk.